Okay, so what, what we're going to do here is uh, run through, I'm going to start by running through some of the results of this major study we've almost completed with GRDC. Uh, and we're looking at the, the cost of weeds and hopefully informing some of the priorities and uh, be keen to hear your, your comments as we uh, quickly go through. So we're looking at considering the cost of weeds and weed management. And I, I guess that one of the reasons for this is, some of you might be familiar with this arcade game, where you, you bang the groundhog or the, or the mole. It's a bit like managing weeds, where as soon as you tackle something and knock something off, another one bobs up or another two or three things. So it's this constant cycle. And uh, every uh, decade or so, it's good probably to take stock of you know, what really is important in terms of uh, economics and costs of weeds at the, at the current state. And that's what uh, we're doing with this study. It's been 15 years since the, the last major study like this, the National uh, Economic Study of Weeds. And I guess the, the real objective here is sort of knowing, knowing the enemy and uh, really taking account of, of where we're at and where are the priorities, even with all this change going on, what really is making a difference in terms of economics and the, the cost of weeds and the management practices around them. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the control, the cost of control, and the fact that just like a lot of the field surveys that are done, such as those in WA and through Chris's group, they're often finding quite reasonably low densities despite all these weed management issues. So at what cost is that, is that coming? It's also about the long reign of ryegrass, despite a lot of other challenges now. Uh, it really is still there because of that extensiveness of uh, the resistance problem as the major cost. But importantly, and something that uh, uh, Gurjeet and Sam Kleeman didn't force me to include here, but really the rise of uh, brome grass compared to, say, the study 15 years ago, just how important that's become. And it really is up there in the top four weeds nationally now, not just in these sort of low rainfall sandy areas, for example. And the fall of uh, the rise of brome, but also the fall of summer, uh, the summer long holiday, because uh, summer weeds is the other sort of, I guess, dramatic change in terms of cost and relative importance in terms of both yield loss and control costs. So let's look at a few figures, and uh, I guess you can zoom in at whatever area you're most uh, interested in. Uh, the most costly weeds to control, this is just the most simplest result, okay? This is just asking what happens if you ask growers. Uh, I just thought I'd put it up here so you can see just how, how brome is up right near the top in terms of cost of control, but ryegrass sitting up there at the top. And I guess the other important thing to observe here across the regions is just how frequent summer weeds are appearing in this, in this list now, and it seems to be an increasing issue. So to do this study uh, properly, it's across 13 major uh, grain zones, northern zone as well, southern and uh, western zones. 600 farmers were involved and a lot of consultants, probably some of you in this room, uh, with uh, Alan Mayfield and Steve Walker, if you're up in the north, uh, seeking your opinions on some of the things that weren't covered in the, uh, in the farmer interviews. And the cost we're looking at is a, a wide range of things, from the yield loss, which is not necessarily the most important, yield loss due to weeds being present, either in summer or the winter crops, the herbicide cost as well as a full suite of uh, what you might call IWM practices as well and uh, attributing costs to those uh, and also the costs of grain cleaning and other uh, contamination. So a whole range of costs going into some of these total costs. I won't be able to explain the method in too much detail. But I guess if, if you're looking at this big pie of how much weeds are costing the Australian grains industry, it's going, it's going to come in at around $3 billion. It's, it's a big amount compared to a lot of the other challenges facing growers. It's a big figure, but not a, not a surprising figure. And what we're, what we're looking at here is just how much of that pie is due to that weed competition effect and how much of that cost is due to the control and all the efforts that go into it, whether herbicides or, or other things. And you can see just how important the control cost is when you consider the, the full cost of weeds to the Australian grains industry. And there's a small sliver there for cost of contamination, such as for downgrading or, or cleaning. So we're looking at big uh, big figures, and a lot of it's in that control category. So the total cost of weeds per hectare of crop land, so this is a, a chance to look at what this means in terms of yield loss. And by our calculations, you're looking at around you know, 0.1 to, between 0.1 and 0.2 of a tonne, 0.16 of a tonne in terms of yield loss caused by uh, weeds present in paddocks. And you can look at some of the regions there. It's reasonably uh, consistent, but I guess the, the big factor there is this when you do look at total cost of control and attribute true, co true cost to application, uh, application costs and other things like that, you're looking at some very large um, total weed costs per hectare. 
So if we think back to that pie chart and this control cost slice of that, you know, what's that made up of? This is just a simple breakdown of it. So in season, which is uh, mainly winter uh, for us, obviously, in season herbicide use, 64% of that cost, and that includes application costs, which are substantial. And then you've also got uh, IWM practices and fallow herbicide use. IWM practices also includes cultivation and burning, which can also be in the, in the fallow. So you can see that breakdown. But I guess the point I wanted to make on this slide is if you compare it to Western Australia, that IWM practice uh, segment there is uh, up to 29%. So if you think of that as uh, it's still at, the, I guess, the frontier of resistance costs in a, in a lot of ways, then that is quite a, a big difference between the two regions and perhaps the direction that we're heading. So let's look at some of those practices that are within that um, and just focus on, on a few. So this is adoption of the double knockdown technique over time. And I'm showing you these just so you can get it. It's not showing all the, all the regions, but just so you can get a feel of the trajectory and I guess an impression of how much further we might be able to go with adoption of some of these practices that have been around a long time. They really are taking off in some of the, the summer uh, areas or the more uniform rainfall zones. But focusing on the, on the regions here, you can see the uh, massive adoption uh, at the top in the relative in South Australia in the, in the mid-north rising above the rest. That's the SA Mallee there poking through the, the bottom here. It's still steady, but uh, yet, yet to take off. So the impression from that is even though practice has been around a long time, glyphosate resistance on the rise, there still is a fair distance we can travel with some of these practices in terms of extensive use. This is actually just a percent of growers who've used the practice. So what about crop topping, another practice that's been around a, a, a long time? You can see at the, at the top there, that's the uh, mid-north and uh, York Peninsula as well. Uh, and of course, with increasing uh, break crop use in some of these regions, you can see some quite recent uh, spikes. So there's still a lot, a lot of potential for some of these well-established uh, uh, practices to play a, a major role and an increasing role. Now this is probably one of the, you know, so much talked about practice recently and certainly is one of the most dramatically rapidly adopted practices, particularly when you look at, uh, I've included the uh, WA regions here. So some, some people might call this uh, the Peter Newman effect up there in the northern wheat belt. Pete might call it that himself maybe. But it's a, it's a big uh, adoption effect and it just shows how, how extensive that practice can be compared to some of the other regions where we're operating in down here. But we are seeing some quite substantial uh, uptake, as many of you will, will well know, but it's just a demonstration of, um, we're, you know, we're still at around 21% in the SA Mallee, 31% of farmers just having tried it in the, in the mid-north, according to these figures, so there's a lot more uh, further we can go with some of these practices. And this is, in fact, quite a cheap practice when you, unless you factor in the, say, loss of uh, some, other, some nutrients, some of this is uh, costed in a relatively cheap practice to, to implement if you don't consider nutrient loss. So summer weed costs. So moving on to leading into Gurjeet's talk now and just highlighting the importance of some of these weeds and uh, where they're showing up. Uh, I guess the point to make from this southern region-wide um, result here is just uh, how dominant heliotrope still is. So once again, these extensive weeds that have been around a long time, and uh, Gurjeet might talk about it further, but you know they're, off, they're always there and because they're extensive, they do have this very large cost. And you can see the, the list here, both in terms of area and revenue loss. There's really not a lot of data on the relative competitiveness of summer weeds, so it's quite a, uh, there's not a lot of differenti differentiation. So area correlates due to the method quite closely with uh, effect. If you wanted to look at some of the regions, the SA region's there in, in blue. And if you look at the yield loss just due to summer weed growth, so you're looking at quite low reported densities here. So these are reported densities of mature, typical reported densities of mature weeds. You're looking at uh, yield losses attributed to that of uh, around 0.1 and uh, revenue loss in the subsequent crops of around $20 per hectare. This is on average. So including years where summer weeds don't play a big part in the last two or three years. And I guess I've included the, the Western zone there just to just to highlight that it, it is very regionally dependent in such a win winter dominant rainfall area as Western Australia, these summer weed costs are, are far less. So the Million Dollar Club for summer weeds, just for some of you interested in your own uh, region, so heliotrope really shining out there as a, as a dominant one when you put it in this uh, dollar context. Uh, melon's important and some of, some of the other important weeds that Gurjeet will be talking about such as fleabane and others uh, appearing there as well. 
Now, I just thought I'd finish this sort of quick snapshot of these results. The, the full report will be coming uh, through GRDC in the coming months, we hope. Uh, and I guess for people working with farmers uh, and dealing with sort of trying to get them to invest for conservation of some of these important herbicides, it's worth looking at this result. We've, we've done, we did this 10 or 12 years before, and it has to be said that farmers still remain ever the optimists when it comes to the potential for new technology or the expectation of new herbicide technology. This is focused on, focused on a replacement for glyphosate for knockdown use, for example. And you've got about 60% or so of farmers expecting a glyphosate replacement able to kill resistant weeds to come around in about 10 years. Um, so I'm not sure that seems quite uh, reasonable to me given, and you can understand why they expect that given recent experience with uh, products like Secura and things that have come around. And the people who actually had that level of optimism 10 years ago around selective herbicides were probably proven right. So you have to work with that level of optimism when dealing with encouraging long-term uh, investment. So just to finish off before Gurjeet uh, steps up here. So growers are investing very heavily. I mean, this, this is a, a big cost uh, related to weeds when you look at some similar studies around disease and other, other things. And we think we've been pretty conservative with a lot of the assumptions in this, in this study, always erring on the side of uh, being conservative when faced with a cost decision. Broom costs are, are high, wide, wider than I expected in terms of the regions affected and where it's figure, figuring prominently. And, um, and that's even with relatively low, you know, resistance is and will be a, an issue, but at the moment, compared to ryegrass and other weeds, it's relatively low. So this is a cost even without high resistant levels at the moment. Uh, so no doubt that will rise. The relative cost of summer weeds, um, I just thought I'd finish with this comment around research. I mean, when you get stuck into this sort of work and you see this, how significant the summer weed cost is alongside in-crop you know, winter weeds, for example, the relative cost of some weeds is not really reflected in the amount of research available on them. And uh, with, uh, you know, shifts in cropping, they're going to become increasingly important and probably uh, more and more focus on summer weed management. So I'll leave it there and thank my uh, co-authors and all the uh, farmers and advisors who are contributors to this. Thanks, Rick.